Warning, the following live broadcast may contain loud, obnoxious, shrill, and alarming noises that might be considered disturbing, if not right uncomfortable to listen to, especially if you are wearing headphones. And I am not talking about me talking, you cheeky monkeys. I share my office space with an African gray parrot and two parakeets, and I have no control over their behavior while I am live streaming, unlike my regular videos where I have the opportunity to edit them out as best as I can. If you are sensitive to loud, surprising background noises, I recommend either not turning your volume up too loud or watching my edited pre-recorded videos instead. Um, hopefully, uh, yeah, I just cleaned out the cage too. So he has all brand new boxes and paper. So he might be a little bit more excitable uh, this time around because, you know, he has all these fresh boxes to chew up. But that's besides the point. Viewer discretion is advised. Oh, goodness. Oh, where's my thing here? Oh, here we go. It's like, no matter no matter how far in advance, I, I think, you know, I, I have everything set up. It, it never starts off the way I want it. The setup, the, the layout never works the way I want. But, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, so welcome, everybody, to another um episode of the live stream of my draw stream so thank you so much uh for everyone uh that's uh watching uh right now um trying a couple of new things um what happens uh usually i have a direct link uh to facebook uh that usually i'm streaming directly to facebook but uh stream kind of changed a couple of things and made it a little bit more obnoxious um so if you're used to watching this on facebook um yeah just follow the link over to youtube i do have a post on my uh, page uh on the, that that has a link directly to the youtube page um you know it, it's just we're, we're just gonna have to deal with a couple of things right now although today i am instead of uh streaming directly to facebook um i am streaming to twitter uh, for the first time. So uh, thank you everybody who would be, who is joining me uh, from Twitter. Um, you know, I hope, uh, you know, I can entertain you at least for the next uh, two half months. So yeah, so a couple of little things uh, going on here and there. Like I said, if you're used to watching this on Facebook, yeah, just, just follow the link to YouTube because like I said, it's like StreamYard is doing some odd things that I don't like. And, um, and yeah, like something about making events or something, and then nobody can find the post until after that the stream is over. And it's like, you know, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not dealing with that. So, so yeah, so that that's uh, where I'm at right now. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daphne Lage, and I'm a cartoonist, illustrator, and comic book artist from New York. And uh, yeah, and because um, I have, you know, these, it's like there's always something new going on. So um, hold on, let me just adjust this here. Okay, yeah, you know what? It's like, okay, I'm just going to have to deal with how I have everything set up right now. It's like I just wanted to make sure I'm not accidentally muted or anything. Um, oh, there, oh, hello. Yes, 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 he does. Um, actually, luckily, he runs around the uh, room while I'm doing that. Uh, so the, the trick is to uh, keep an eye on him so he's not pooping on stuff that he's not supposed to be pooping on. So you know, and hello, Okia Fern. Hello, welcome, welcome. So where was I? Oh, yes, I was introducing myself. Like I said, I'm Daphne. I'm a cartoonist, illustrator, comic book artist from New York, publishing independent comics since 1992. So I kind of sort of know what I'm talking about. Oh, Amy, I am known for the furry animal fantasy adventure, Tall Tales, and my medieval fantasy soap opera drama, Eagle Raven, Heir of the First Unicorn. The body's not even cold yet. And already I am talking about the pre-launch page for issue five coming up in November. 
so links are going to be in the show notes below. But we are definitely going to be talking about this a little bit in a little bit because uh, this is all I pretty much talk about nowadays because that's what happens, you know. Oh, good. there we go, my border. I, I really wish Streamyard would. You know, you know, you don't need me. You don't need to hear me bitching about Streamyard. You know, the little. You don't need me. It's like so. I am also co-host with Nina Lanning on the Raging to the Vlogs show uh, on uh, every Monday and Friday on the Indie Comics Network. I forgot that I had uh, updated that information. <laughs> yes, so you can catch us uh, every Monday and Friday at 11 a.m., although this Friday we will not have a show because uh, I have uh, an appointment to take care of. So, uh, yeah, so no show, uh, but we will be back uh, Monday at 11 a.m. normally uh normally with uh with the show it's a, a hour-long vlog ish show where we have interviews sometimes and whatnot so you can read ah my borders i really gotta okay. you can read both my comics online at tall tales t-a-i-l-s online.com and egoworks.com e-g-o-w-r-k-s where you can check out all my videos on how i make my comics uh here on youtube at my channel at Daphne Lage, L A G E Art, which also simulcasts through the Indie Comics Network. So, like I said, um, if you are watching me from regions beyond, if you are watching me from Facebook, which uh, I am not directly streaming to, but you follow the link, yeah, yeah, come on over to YouTube. You know, click on the link, click on the like and share button, click on the uh, notification bell so you get notified every time I go live, where and uh, anytime any of our shows through the Indie Comics Network uh, goes live. So, uh, so yeah, so you know, it, it, it's a lot easier. You know, I mean, really, it's like, like I said, I don't know what's going on with the whole Facebook thing. So, if you're used to watching this on Facebook, I apologize. But really, you need to be on YouTube. It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier for everybody. You know? <laughs> yes, it's just Friday. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's just Friday. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because it's like, you know, I, I don't, uh, it, it's like, look, I don't believe in, uh, well, it's like, not that I don't believe. It's just that, you know, I don't have the time to do like pre recorded shows and then worry, you know, like, do it's like, look, if I can't do a show, we just don't do the show. You know, it's like, look, everybody, you know, there's plenty of other things on YouTube uh, for everybody to watch. So, you know, don't, like I said, don't worry, we'll be back on, on Monday. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be back to our normal schedule. It's just like, you know, I have things to do. So, uh, you know, and, the, you know, Friday was the only way, day I could do it. So, no show. Uh, yes, un <laughs> unfortunately for us, uh, the appointment uh, has nothing to do with New York Comic Con. So, um, but the thing is, though, yeah, unfortunately, I had uh, found out that New York Comic Con uh, was this week because I learned this morning that, um, oh, what was that artist, uh, Kim G? Ah, I forgot. Um, I forgot his, uh, oh, what was his name? Oh, uh, I mean, it's like, really, maybe, maybe I should have decided. So there was a uh, very popular uh, artist that passed uh, this morning. Uh, and, and I, it was just like he had, a, he was getting on a plane in France and he had a heart attack at the airport. Hold on. I, I it's like, uh, uh, right. Uh, yeah. I, I, no, it's like, it, yes, we have lives. It's not like we're getting paid for this shit. So if we need to skip a show, we're going to skip a show. <laughs> it's not, uh, oh, but now it's going to bother me that I don't know this artist's name that, uh, hold on, let me, cause now I'm feeling like such an asshole about to talk about him and I don't know his name. So, or at least not from memory. Um, yeah, Jung Jung Ji Kim, uh, J U N G G I Kim. Um, he was especially noted uh, for his uh, crowd scenes and the fact that he could draw. You, you've all, I'm sure you've all seen videos. Of, you can find videos of him 
uh, drawing uh, on, on YouTube where he's literally drawing these really, really intricate um, crowd scenes on a blank canvas. Like, cause, cause I guess he has, yes, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, where um, you know, like like he's he doesn't do like construction lines or anything. He just draws straight, and he said that he uh, he credits as having a photographic memory for his ability to do that. Um, and what happened was that uh, he was finishing up his European tour. Um, he was uh, he was going to because he lives in France, and he was at it. I guess he was at an airport in Paris and he was about to get on a plane to come to New York Comic Con uh, where, you know, he's a guest and whatnot. And he had a heart attack at the airport and they took him to the hospital where he died at the hospital. And I was just like going, oh, like two things. Like, like oh, wait, it's like, oh, New York Comic Con was this weekend. And I go, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, this guy just died. <laughs> the fuck? And I was like, that's crazy. So he's like, he was 47. You know, I mean, really, it, it's like it just it just goes to remind you all our names are in the ledger. And when it's time, it's time. You know, I mean, yeah, for real. I mean, that's um, that that's all we can hope for. You know, that's all we can hope for. Like, I think like uh, Hubert, uh, Joe Kubert, he died at his drawing table. Um, Gil Evergren, he died in, like he was literally in the middle of a painting. And uh, I mean, really, it, it's like that's all we can hope for, really. Like I said, all our names are in the ledger. You know, it's just, you know, that's why it's like it's just so important that we're not wasting our time, you know, really. Um, yeah. So what else is going on? Um, yeah. So, you know, as uh, the title of uh, my I guess I was decided trying to figure out, like trying to think of my themes in advance. And um, pretty much, uh, like I said, uh, Eagle Raven is, uh, oh, here we are. There we go. <laughs> Tall Tales doesn't come back until January. So don't worry. So if you're waiting for Tall Tales, don't worry about it. January, the, the early, early uh, 2023, Tall Tales is coming back to Kickstarter. But for now, I am an absolute slut for my unicorn girl. So... <laughs> Yes, she is. Uh, so yes, yeah, so Eagle Raven issue five is coming back to Kickstarter on November seventh, and uh, yeah, and it's in pre-launch now. All the links are in the uh, show notes, and uh, yeah, so it's like I'm in this really middle quiet stage where everything is at the printers, you know, everything is being manufactured. I mean, it's like all I could do is just fold up some boxes to try to feel like I'm moving along when, you know, there's nothing going on. Um, and and that's, yeah. So it's like it now it's just like this kind of like this weird blank period where there's absolutely nothing going on with the Kickstarter. There's nothing I can do, you know. And, um, yeah, and I'm just trying to, like, navigate this very strange uh, period before this, the books come in and then it's like all hands on deck. But speaking of crowdfunding, um, I do have some links in the, uh, yeah, I, I do have some links in the chat and also in the show notes of crowdfunders that uh, I am looking forward to, that I'm enjoying, that I've, uh, that I've pledged to, or that I just want to like help spread the word about. Um, the first one, the first crowdfunder that I want to talk about is uh, Vicenia's, uh, Vicenia Lindsay's uh, Pulsetober uh, art book. Um, it is, she has her own book called uh, Celestial Pulse. And honestly, it, it's like, I'm, you know, I, it's like, I can't wait until that Kickstarter comes out when she decides to, when she decides to put out Celestial Pulse um, as a trade. Of which she did say was going to happen. But for now, she has this art book where she has her mascot character, Pulsey, of kind of like cosplaying as like DC and Marvel characters. And uh, what was cool was that I pledged, I happened to pledge during her live stream, which by the way, she's streaming on Twitch and it's a four hour stream. So <laughs> if, you're, if you're into that, you can watch her on a four hour stream doing uh, what she's calling Pulse Tober. 
and uh, she's actually doing a kind of doing Pulsey cosplaying as a Eagle Raven as a thank you for her thank you page in the book. So I'm really, really looking forward uh, uh, to, to seeing that. So check out the Pulsetober art book. Um, it's a lot of, it, it looks like a lot of fun. Her artwork is just, you know, it, it's just, I, I just, you know, like it's one of those love at first sight things. And uh, like I said, she has a book called um, Celestial Pulse, which is kind of like a, a, a shoujo type, you know, it, it's like, look, it, it just look, it, I you can read the first uh, the first two issues uh, for free on her website. And it just pushes all my buttons. She has a Highlander. She has a vampire. And she has the girl that they're both kind of like sworn to protect, but they themselves are rivals. It's like, it's like, thank you. <laughs> you know? it's like, that's, that's what I want. That's what I want. More of that. You know, so there we go. So, so post over art book uh, number uh, number two, check that out. Uh, the next campaign is Bloodwing Angel, the Bloodwing Angel Chronicles by John Celestri, animation legend. If you saw the Star Wars Christmas uh, special, the Boba Fett section, that was his. So that was his, so that's his claim to fame, uh, uh, along with the rest of your childhood in the 80s. <laughs> so if you had a childhood in the 80s, John Celestri was responsible for it. So, uh, yeah, so he has his book, Bloodwing Angel Chronicles, books one, two, and three, which I am very happy uh, to finally get a chance to. I, I lost, I had supported it in the past, but I lost the books uh, because of a flood in my office. So I'm just very happy for the opportunity to replace them so I could actually read them. It was such a mess. I had a whole box full of like crowdfunding books that I was that I was meant to read and whatnot. And I was like, wait, what's that smell? And it's all like a pull the box out, it's just all rotting paper. It was just it was horrible. So but the flooding is fixed now, so we don't have that problem. But still though, now everything is in a plastic bin if it even touches the floor. So we're not having that trouble again. So yes, Bloodwing Angel uh, Chronicles. Uh, that um, uh, also, and like I said, all the links are in the show notes uh, below. Uh, the next one is Snowpaw. Rob Moltari's Snowpaw, um, the second issue. It's like honestly, I'm waiting for the trade paperback to come out. Ever since I had the the office redone, um, literally trade paperbacks are kind of like the only thing that I can like fit in here right now. Um, I, I don't have like everything is the everything all space is like mostly saved for inventory but you know what just because it's like look but you know what just because I have to wait for a trade paperback for this or does it mean that you have to so snowpaw one one to two Scottish like it says there 19th century Scottish female werewolves uh, uh, we're, like Viking werewolves again pushing my buttons Viking where everyone's a werewolf and there's a Viking world. There we go. That's all you need to know. And it's just, just go to the link and, and support it. And congratulations, uh, Rob Moltari, for, for another absolutely successful uh, Kickstarter right now. And last but not least, there's an alien in my toilet book three. You know, so this is a Sam Vera's, uh, this is Sam Vera's book. Uh, book three, well, and, and uh, this is the next chapter in the Duty from Uranus series. Uh, yes, judging from the title, yes, it is an all-ages uh, sci-fi story where he takes the funniest kid's joke and turns it into a comic, you know, because, of course, you have to. So there's an alien in my toilet, book three. I think it has 14 days left to go. It's very close to funding. Uh, this is the next chapter, and he also has a another book on there in in the campaign where it's a uh, duty on planet Cthulhu. So uh, so yeah, so actually he has three books of these campaigns depending on the age range of uh, you know he's he's running a little like mini scholastic you know uh, uh, book fair on his Kickstarter right now. So it's like he has all the age ranges. So you have the all ages. There's an alien in my toilet. He says that it was like uh, I said on a, uh, on a he said on a previous campaign. If you're like have a kid from seven and up, um, you know that's good for them. 
Um, then he has Duty on Planet Cthulhu, which I think is a little bit more like the kids are in high school. And then it's like if you want something for, for uh, like if you have younger kids in your family, he even has Duty's Adventures where it's kind of like a story and a workbook where the kids can like draw their own characters and write their own ending to the story. It's very clever. Uh, so make sure you check that out. There's Alien in My Toilet, book three, I Chihuahua. You know, so like I said, all the links are in the show notes um, below. Um, if, if everyone is a werewolf, would the term werewolf if even exist? Yeah, I would think by then it would just be, you know, everyone's a furry. Uh, I think that's the case anyway. <laughs> but I think it's just the, the idea that everyone can, you know, change into, you know, that, that it's people and then that. It's like, I think the werewolf, the term werewolf would exist. Um, it's just that it wouldn't be that big of a deal. So, <laughs> hello, Nicholas. Hello. Um, there you go. Oh, I mean, it's like waking up at bedhead. It's just how you look at a given time, not like you've really changed. Well, that's true. It depends on how you look at it. But I mean, I, I think the word, the term werewolf would, would still probably exist because technically they're not human, right? So... You know, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what that is, I guess. But like I said, but again, check out all the links in the uh, the show notes uh, below. Uh, so yeah, so so that's what. Uh, oh yes, uh, <laughs> well, enjoy. I don't know if enjoying, hey Nicholas. I don't think enjoying um, is the right word here. <laughs> so um, so yeah, so that's. So yeah, so that's uh, what's kind of I guess that's what my housekeeping I I guess you know that uh, that's going on right now. But uh, yeah, so like I said, I'm in kind of like this weird middle period uh, where everything's at the printers. There's nothing I can do, you know, in terms of the this campaign that finished. So you know, so I have my I'm trying to stay busy. I have my pile of inking that, I, that I'm still going through. Um, oh, let me let me show you a couple of things. So on the last uh, episode, uh, last couple of episodes, I was working on some sketch covers for um, the Oswald Chronicles. And uh, I was doing a uh, Hernanimous Bosch theme on all of the covers. So um, here I finished, was able to finally finish two of them completely. So I was able to color them and whatnot. So I just wanted to show everybody. So this is the first one. This is the first completed sketch cover uh, that uh, I finished. I was like, yeah, so it's like the weird thumbtack guy. So it's like, like I said, if, if you're not familiar with the reference, just look up Hernanimous Bosch, The Garden of Earthly Delights, go all the way to the right, the right side panel, the darker one, where I think it's supposed to be represent hell or something. And all the crazy monsters that I reference are in that panel, uh, in that painting. So, so this is the first one that I did. And then the second one that I was able to finish, this is it right here. So there we go. And of course, I had to do a little Looney Tunes reference to, I think it's like, uh, it was uh, the Marvin the Martian when he puts his little flag on the earth and it has a little screwball on it. So I figured it was just perfect uh, for a Hernanimous Bosch monster to do, to have the same thing. So, uh, so yeah, so that's the second uh, cover that I finished. So at least that's one person I'm able to cross off the list as they're getting their very late Oswald package, <laughs> you know, from, uh, you know, it's like JB has already finished another campaign uh, in, in the, the time it's taking me to do these uh, sketch covers. I mean, it, this this particular batch ha, it was, it's just taking me a, a lot longer than it usually does. But, you know, but I just have just like so much to do. And it's just like, sometimes it's just so hard to pace myself. So, uh, yeah. Oh, so speaking of, um, you know, not really being able to do much. Like I said, everything, I'm waiting for everything to come back to the printers. But in the meantime, I had gotten uh, a couple of things already. Um, I don't, don't remember if I showed these to you on the last 
on the last show, but I'm going to show them really quickly um, again. So these are some of the stretch goals that uh, we were able to unlock on the last campaign. So this is the bookmark that uh, that we were able to unlock on the campaign. So that's in. Um, here is the first art print, four by six art print that uh, I also that we also unlocked as well. It's just a postcard as well. I like it's a nice thick paper. So it's a I think I got sixteen point. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the first one. And and then this is the second stretch goal print that everyone everyone who did a physical order is going to get. So that's again, it's another another art print slash postcard that we got that we unlocked. And also just for shits and giggles, this is the promo. This is this uh, campaign's promo postcard. Um, everybody that that everyone again who got a physical order they're gonna get this as well it's the full cover uh, of the trade paperback and just with information for the next campaign uh, coming up see November 7th November 7th is the magic number I guess so uh, yeah so those you know so those those came in within days of, of me ordering it um, Let's see. Oh, draw for fun. Well, you see, <laughs> I don't know if that's really accurate either, because it's like, oh, especially when it comes to Eagle Raven, it's kind of like both. You know, like I have to get all this stuff done, but it's like when I start, you know, when I start working on it, it's like I get so in the zone that it's like, it's like, it's, you know, it's, you know what, it's, it's the, the answer is yes, no, yes and no. Um, I, but I guess that's the beauty of being able to work, you know, to, to like work on my own stuff, you know, that whole thing, you know, do what you love and you never work a day in your life. Well, no, you're working every, every goddamn minute of your day, but at least you're working on something that's yours. And, um, and it, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm literally working on something that's mine and mine alone, you know, and my effort is my own. And it's like, you know, I, I, like I said, I am so in the zone, you know, with, with drawing stuff for, for Eagle Raven that it's like, yeah, I guess you could say I am having fun uh, with it, but it's still work, <laughs> you know? Um, oh, oh, okay. So, uh, well, we can, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, yes, exactly. We all love the weird, we all love that Bosch, the weird dude. Yes, we do. Uh, yes, the the nerd verb. Yes, definitely. That's uh, what he is with his little screwball flag. That's he is. Um, you know, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, you're patriotic for a lot of countries today. Please help me. Um, I can only recommend getting a map. That's all I can say. <laughs> That's all I can say. I, I don't know. There's a lot of things going on in the world. Uh, just get a map to keep track of it. That, that's all I can uh, suggest, really. Um, so yeah, so that's so that's the thing. So um, so that's kind of what I have really quick uh, so far. So what I'm gonna do is because I know that you, you guys are all here to watch me draw and stuff, you know, and not to babble away on stuff. Um, yeah. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch over um, to the next. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna switch over to let's see to my other screen. Actually, I'm gonna do this. Let's see. How, how did I do that? Okay, so there we go. So this is what I have on the drawing table today. Um, so what it is, is like I did like a stack of 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 pages and images that I'm I'm getting through. And what I did was I just laid down the initial inks on it and then get a little pile going. And then now it's like I'm going to finish up the inks so that I can send. The, I can I can start feeding my flatter uh, work. Um, the thing is though, this is technically a future me problem uh, image. Um, but you know what? It's like uh, I really, you know, it's like whatever. It's in the pile. I, I want to be able to um, 
to, to just finally finish this piece and uh, send it out so that I can get it flatted and then I could just put it to the side and then when I really need to get to it I don't have to worry about anything else but just actually color correcting and then putting in the shading um oh well I mean we're gonna probably we might get to one anyway so but thank you though <laughs> um so this is the wraparound cover to uh, my novel, uh, which comes after the Eagle Raven comic book series. Um, because you know, if uh, uh, you uh, if you're new here and you don't know what I'm talking about, Eagle Raven: Air the First Unicorn is my main comic book series. It's 15 issues. Uh, we're currently up to issue five in terms of Kickstarters. Again, that's going to be launching on November. Uh, 7th, actually, let me put my little reminder down here. Um, so with these, so the, the series is going to be, the comic book series is going to be 15 issues, but pretty much everything else, like all the stories that come out after that, they're going to be illustrated novels. And this is the first one after that uh, issue, uh, the, after the 15 issues that's coming out. Um, I kind of wrecked my schedule these past couple of months because the novel was screaming at me to work on it, which I did. Um, I have the first draft done and being the type of person that I am and how much I'm just obsessed with the story right now. Um, I did this cover for the trade, for, for, it's not a trade paperback, but for the, the novel uh, book. And uh, just to have it just to have it, you know, just to get it out of my system and have it. So I'm going to be inking this, inking the rest of this today. It's, it's actually not finished. You're going to notice the difference when I finish it. Um, and, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I know. It's pretty, it's pretty epic. You know, um, I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, I'm very happy with the way this worked out. And uh, I hope that uh, everybody who reads the novel kind of gets that sense um, in the book. Um, so it, here's the thing though, before I get started though, I wanted to show everybody something because you know, like I said, I'm, I'm just like completely obsessed. Like I, I've finished the first draft. It's, it's over 200 pages, 67,000 words, the whole, the whole nine yards. Right. And, and the thing is though, it's like now, uh, Nita is beta reading. She's be, she's the first beta reader for the book. So, um, I, uh, you know, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. I try. It, it's all, you know, it's just pushing forward. I want to see a fucking AI do this. That, that's all I can say. Actually, no, I don't want to see an AI do this. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know. Um, so Nina is uh, going to do the first pass on it. Um, and then I'm going to start really, you know, editing it. But like right now, it, it's kind of like I'm just in this like, you know, just just getting this. Uh, I'm in again this kind of weird phase where it's like I'm obsessed with the book, but there's really nothing I can do about it right now. So I figure I might as well just work on the cover. Um, but here's the funny thing though. So I keep reading it that at first draft over and over and over again, you know. And it's like, and I have a ton of edits that I have in my head, it's like, I should do this, should that, but I don't want to touch anything until after Nita gets back, gets back to me. No pressure, girl, no pressure. Um, you know, so, um, so, um, so the, the funny thing is that so I was reading it in, um, in uh, Acrobat, because I have, I made a PDF of it, so I could have it on my phone and whatnot. You know, um, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm reading it in Acrobat. I'm trying to find something in, in the menus. I don't know. And then I find a read out loud version, uh, a read out loud option on in, in Adobe Acrobat. So I don't know if this is in the free version, but I know in the CS version, the, cl the, the CC version that I have, um, it has a read out loud version. So I guess it could, it could read it. So I have this thing reading the novel while I'm working. I, I have this thing reading the novel to me. 
And it's awful. It is absolutely awful. Not the book, but the fact that it uses like a standard AI to read it. And the way it trips over words is hysterical. But at the same time, I'm catching a lot of typos this way. Because, you know, you, you type in like a lot of, you know, you, you type the same word over and over again. So I get used to it, he hearing it. Okay, the AI is saying it this way. And then all of a sudden it says it differently. And I go, there's a typo there. It's like I go to look, there's a typo. So that's, so it's actually kind of weirdly helpful. So um, it's awful, but at the same time, I'm obsessed with, with this thing. It's kind of like, it's, it's a really bad audiobook version. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, uh, but it's actually, I'm actually finding it helpful and actually somewhat entertaining. Um, I actually want to see if I can get you guys to hear it. So b before we get started, so let me see if I can just bring it up. Um, you know, oh, and, and which also means that technically you guys are going to get a sneak peek at this first draft. So, <laughs> So just remember, it's a first draft. Um, it, it's it's a first draft, and uh, and and yeah. Let me see if I can. Let me see full screen layout. So uh, let me let me see what I got here. Let me see. Yeah, because it's like I guess it's like. Okay, there we go. Okay, I think we got it. Oh no, and here and. All right, so you you're all getting kind of like a a okay. So where is it? Okay, I don't want it on the full screen mode. Where, where is it? Add to stream. Okay. Okay, so this is okay. So this is like a, a sneak peek of the first draft. Um. So what what page is that? I can't I can't tell on the screen. Was this page ninety nine? I think it's it's on ninety eight on my end. So let me see if I can get this. I'm hoping that you okay. Let me see if I can get this to do this. If you can hear this, tell me if you can hear this. Can you guys hear that? Somebody tell me if you could hear this. Oh, no, you can't hear it. You can't hear it. Okay. All right. So. Okay, you can't hear it. Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. I guess since it's, it's not like a website. Ah, I guess since it's not a website or something, a StreamYard can't. Uh, let me try something. Let me try because this thing is. I I really want you to hear this shit. Hold on, hold on. It is so. Just so you guys get a sense. Okay, so I'm. What it is like? I'm removing you through out of my out of my headphones. So it's going to come out of my speaker and you should be able to hear it through the microphone. So let's, okay, so let's try this now. Let's try this now. It's, it's awful. I want you guys to experience how awful this reading is. <laughs> Enter even, cult of the wolf witch, tribes, and family. The stag grazed, unaware of the wolf that stalked it. As the Uchks were pushed deeper into the forest, the Kanavar extended their barrier around the manor, claiming back more of the woods. Taking advantage of the extended range, the lone wolf decided on a hunt that had nothing to do with the cursed men they fought so long and hard against. Crouching low, the dusky wolf prepared his arrow on the bowstring but was not quite ready to make his kill. He crept around the trees his heavy paws unusually silent with his cloak making more noise as it dragged through the foliage. His ears pointed forward in full attention. He raised his bow, squinting his eye to ensure his aim was true. He flared his nostrils, picking up the heavy musk of the stag and a faint hint of roses. 
His muscles relaxed as he mentally gave up his opportunity for a clear shot but didn't lower his weapon just yet. It is unbecoming of an emissary to be sneaking around people, he spoke while still keeping his eye on his target. The rustling behind him was enough to catch the animal's attention, and he cursed to himself as it bounded away. However, it was not in the full panic he was afraid of but enough to know that its current grazing was not completely safe. The wolf let out a deep breath, at least thankful a full chase would not be necessary. He lowered his bow and sighed, turning his gaze to the unicorn woman standing hesitantly behind him. I'm sorry I frightened your quarry, Edraven replied. The wolf put his arrow back in the quiver. Luckily, you didn't frighten it, just spooked it enough to move. Edraven, called of the wolf witch. Is, hold on, hold on. I, I mean, really, right? I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, is that like the most hideous voiceover have you, you've ever, you've ever heard? I, I mean, it, it's just, yeah, it, it's like, and the fact that, and here's the thing too, it only says Ego Raven's name correctly if it has an apostrophe S at the end of it, you know? I mean, that's the funniest thing. It says Edge Raven up until the point there's an apostrophe S, and then the dumb thing says Ego Raven. And I go, you know what? Maybe I wouldn't hate it so much if it said Ego Raven correctly the entire time. But no, it pronounces it, it Edge Raven until there's an apostrophe S. It is horrible. But at the same time, it's like, um, <laughs> it's like, like I said, I'm catching a lot of spelling mistakes this way. And, um, and uh, you know, it, it's like, let's see, it's here. Yes, it is awful. It is awful. Um, it, it comes, it's just a thing. It's just an option in Adobe Acrobat, or at least in the, in the cloud version that I use, uh, cause it comes with the Adobe subscription. Um, it, you, you just, oh, what, what is it? Uh, you have to go, you go under, let's see, view, you go under the view option and it's read out loud. And it, that's exactly what it's doing. It is reading out loud. Um, hold on. Let me put you guys back in my ear. Hold on. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, you'd think with all the improvement in deep fake tech that people would figure out how to make simple, more human sounding computer voices. Yeah. You would think, right? Um, especially Adobe. But oh my God, it is so bad. It's even worse on the phone. Holy crap. I, I tried doing it so I could listen to it on my phone and I had to I, I had to tap out on that. The 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 AI on the phone is even worse than the AI they use in Adobe. Oh my god. It, it is so now mind you, Nina, there is so I've already had the AI read a couple of scenes, very specific scenes, and it, it it's it's horrible it yeah it really is it is so flat it just it i mean talk about a mood killer <laughs> talk about a mood killer um uh yeah it, it's like, like i said it's in i don't know if it's in the free version of adobe uh but uh, in adobe acrobat but it's in my uh it, it that's yeah so i came across that accidentally um yeah, I know. It's just really funny how it will like it. Yeah, it just there's a reason why it's like I have a setup upstairs specifically to do voiceovers so I can do voiceovers, you know, because um, I am planning on uh, on, on translating. Um, well, kind of, you know, kind of like doing audiobook versions of my prose. this, you know, and this is going to be one of them. And uh, yeah, I have a whole setup for that so I can read it and get the inflection and, you know, and whatever. And yeah, but this, this is extremely utilitarian. That's for sure. Uh, yes, gloriously painful. Um, oh my God. No, the, you know what? Don't, don't put that out in the universe. <laughs> yes. Yes, Nita. It's like, cause I'm having it read through the entire book. You know, so it's, yeah, like I said, it, it's, 
it's it's awful and fascinating at the same time. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Like they never changed it from the 80s, you know? But uh, yeah, so that's what uh, I've been entertaining myself uh, with um, in terms of the novel. And I just I just wanted to share that with everybody. Um, and uh, let's see, hold on, hold on. Oh, hold on. I got, uh, ooh, I got some people acting up today. What the heck is that? Is that block, block, block? Okay, good. All right. According to the, okay, so according to this, all right. Okay, good. Oh, wow. Okay. I am getting, oh, all right, hold on. It's like the chat is getting, uh, okay, hold on. I got like some bot shit going on. It's like, <laughs> you see, it's called out the, the AI reading called out all its brethren. Um, you know, so it's like, hold on. I, I am getting some crazy ass spam here hold on hold on let's see it, it's like yeah oh okay all right good oh you got it okay yeah because holy crap it's like all of a sudden it's just like but and it's like i don't know what the fuck is going on you know so okay so so nina so while nina cleans up the mess that's going on right now maybe you see maybe use you know like having the ai on the air just uh just uh oh here you okay so here you are nicholas just making it all <laughs> yeah i know i don't understand it i don't understand how it's pronouncing like why it takes an apostrophe s for it to uh to to pronounce it correctly um you know it's like ooh, you know it's like oh she's not like yeah she well she definitely is not i mean that is kind of the, the gist of the story um holy moly yeah i know right yeah it's like yeah um yes and nina's oh no, nina says that she's cleaning it up on her end so uh yeah this is just like yeah, holy crap. Yeah, it's like, okay, so, so yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, so that's, what, that's just, yeah, I know, right? It's like, you know, you put a little AI voice in everything and they all, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, that's what's going on. Holy crap, the chat is a mess now. So, uh, so yeah, so you know what, I guess that's my cue to actually start working on this thing. So how about that, you know? So uh, please excuse the mess that's in the chat right now. Nina is currently cleaning it. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, oh my God. Oh, hey, Marvie, hey. It's like uh, how I'm able, <laughs> you know, Let's see. Yeah, I mean. Wow. Okay. So so there we go. You know what? It's like, like I said, Nita's cleaning that up. So um, so if I don't catch you, you know, it's like so if for some reason I don't uh, catch you in the chat, it's because we're having a spam bot problem right now. And uh yeah, so <laughs> So let's, you know, so let me just move the camera over here and get this thing started. So, so as you can see here, I have my basic inks down. Uh, also, you know what, let me, uh, let me get this started as well. Cause let me see. Okay. So I just want to, there we go. So that way we can get our music going. I mean, this you guys should be able to hear, right?
right? So you you guys can hear that, right? Wow, I can't get over the chat right now. You know, the, the chat is just being absolutely flooded, you know, but, um, you know, it's like, I mean, I think it might be coincidence from the AI, but, but everybody can at least hear the music, right? Because, I mean, this should be working normally. Um, okay, good. Thank you very much. There we go. So, um, yeah, so this is, these are the initial inks that I put down uh, with my rapidiograph. So this, I, I use this to get this basic inks down. So now what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to take my larger pens and I'm going to start like beefing up the inks a bit. So, um, okay. So, so yeah, so there we go. So yeah, so just tell me if, uh, if it sounds like if the, the music is louder than I'm talking. Because, you know, I can obviously adjust the sound in my headphones. It's just that I don't know how it's actually sounding on, um, on the screen, you know. So, okay, so where was I? Yeah, so like I said, I'm in the middle of this weird um, quiet period uh, between campaigns. I mean, um... Now, my original schedule had me running another campaign on in November. Um, it was originally supposed to be Peacekeepers, but I decided I was going to move Eager Raven up so I could fit one more Eager Raven campaign in the year. And You know, and now it just feels kind of weird uh, having a pre-launch page for um, having a pre-launch page for um, a campaign uh, for the next campaign when this one isn't uh, done yet. Uh, you know, I mean, but at the same time, it's like, well, the second that I get my stuff in, I'm going to be able to fulfill. So it's not like. And the other campaign doesn't launch until November 7th anyway. So, you know, what am I really concerned about, right? And, you know, and it's like, I guess one of the things that I am concerned about is that I'm kind of like, you know, is it possible for me to overwhelm everybody with too much, like, you know, I'm sure, you know, everyone's heard the phrase campaign fatigue. So, um, you know, and I'm a little concerned about that. But at the same time, it's like, I kind of hope that my reputation running these campaigns kind of, you know, you know, that, that people aren't like, oh, you haven't fulfilled yet and you already you're talking about the next campaign. And and it's like, well, one, it's it's my show, so I can talk about it, right? <laughs> I should be able to talk about it. But um but at the same time, it's like, well, I mean, it's just a pre-launch. By the time the actual launch happens, everybody's uh, everybody's pledges from the last, from the, the, the volume one campaign that that should either already be in the mail or everybody should be getting them, you know? So, um, so, you know, yeah. So like in the end, it's like, I'm not really sure what, um, I'm really worried about. Um, but of course, you know, one of the things that, um, what, one of the things that, that it's like, well, if, if I can't worry anymore about this campaign, <laughs> let me fuss with, uh, the other campaign because, um, hold on, let me, let me just check something here. 
let's see. I think we're good. It's like, holy shit. It's like every time I look over here in the chat, it's nothing but bots. Like, what the fuck? Fuck Lucy. Whoever the fuck Lucy is, fuck Lucy. But then again, that might be the point of the of the bots. You know? Um that is so obnoxious. It's like here I'm like, I'm trying to have a conversation with everybody, and these bots are like just just flooding the uh the chat but uh, okay whatever it, you know that that's just you know that's just what it is you know um so uh so the only so the only thing of course that instead of like actually trying to focus on um all the work that uh, i have to do which you know i still have to do anyway right so i started kind of fussing with the next campaign and it's like, okay, how much stuff can I offer um, in the campaign uh, to help move it along? Um, I guess like in tandem with how the with how the, the trade the, the, the trade paperback campaign did. Um, oh, okay, all right, good. So if you're not uh, all right, because on my end, I'm saying so that okay. So that it, like I said, uh, Nita said that she was taking care of that. So probably what it is is that it shows up on my end, but then Nita gets on top of it and then she's clearing it out as the, you know, so it disappears on YouTube. But I can still see the, uh, I guess whatever ends up in the chat on my end, um, and of course, ah, oh, here, okay, there we go. So, um, you know, cause that's, that's one thing that, uh, I'm a little concerned about is how do I make sure the next campaign keeps up the momentum that I guess the trade paperback kind of inadvertently, um, Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nita. Yes. Um, you know, so yeah, so uh, yeah, so like I said, Nita's mopping up. Um, we have, you know, so, okay. So yeah, so my concern is like, okay, the trade paperback did something I wasn't expecting it to do. And it's kind of like altered my expectations. Um, you know, it's it's altering my expectations for the next campaign. And the thing is, is that JD's a little concerned that I might be a little too fussy with the idea because, of course, you know, he doesn't want me to like try to hype myself up or accidentally hype myself up and then it's like i get disappointed and then like if, if the campaign doesn't do as well because here here's the thing here's the thing so the volume uh the the, the volume one campaign um you know it was a more expensive book um i ended up getting you know, not only did I end up get my regulars, but I got people who were waiting for the trade. So for all I know, when the fifth issue comes out, those people are going to, all those people are going to lie low because they're going to be waiting for the next trade for next year. So I won't see them again until next year. Um, will that affect the, uh, will that affect the, uh, you know, my issue five campaign, I don't know. Um, it's, I, and honestly, I mean, logically, it's really the, something I shouldn't be concerned with. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really so, yeah, so I, I think that it's like, 
but I can't help but think about it because it's like, especially when you're looking at other people's campaigns and it's like, okay, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're doing the other thing, they're making this much money. Can I imitate that somehow? Um, you know, how can, you know, it, I, I don't know, maybe the strategy just kind of like starts getting in the way when it's like, you know what? I'm doing the best I can on these campaigns and sometimes it's best just to, you know, leave it at that and then see what happens. I mean, all I can do is just prepare as best as I can, but I have no, I have no control over what the outcome of that might be, you know, as much as I'm trying to kind of like predict it. And, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. Yeah. So it's just like, kind of like, like I said, it's a strange transitional period I'm in right now because I'm waiting for all this stuff to come in. And, uh, you know, so it's like, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so that's kind of like, I'm trying not to freak out about it. But, um... You know, it, it's kind of tough, especially when pretty much like, like, okay, so like New York Comic Con is this weekend, right? Now, we are planning on going to New York Comic Con probably next year. You know, but I, I guess like just more for, I don't know, the network opportunities or whatnot. But I mean, it's, I mean, for me, it's a little hard to justify that the, the price going to Comic-Con is a little hard to justify if the Kickstarters keep growing the way they do. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know what my point is right now um like i said i guess it's just yeah maybe like at what point is it a good idea like at what point do you plan too much for for a campaign that's the thing at what point and i and i kind of think i'm 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 hitting that point um the other day i actually did another variant cover uh for the campaign so this campaign for issue five is going to have four variant covers. Um, oh yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. It, it's extremely crowded. The flow, the flow of the Javits Center is really bad. Like I don't understand why it's so difficult, you know, especially and the way they divide up the sections like the artist alley and stuff, it's just kind of weird. But then again, the last time um, I was at I was at New York Comic Con, it was also in the middle of construction at the Javits. So I don't know if it's like um, any better. Um, so yeah, but yeah, it's um, let's see, let's see. Also, yeah, I stopped. Yeah, because it is expensive. I, I mean, it's like it. it it was really good in the beginning. And I think what happened, it got taken over by Reed Pop. And then like all the prices shot up. They had this weird thing that if you get a booth, you have to bring your own tables. And it, it's like such a hassle. Yeah. And that's the thing too. I liked anime nyc because also that way if you could get in the main show you can if you got in the anime section you'd at least was down you at least were downstairs 
So they had New York Comic Con on the top floor, and then they had Anime NYC up at the bottom. So it was a lot easier for us to get into the anime show than the main floor, but it worked out really well at the time. Um, oh, uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, just a little uh, shout out uh, to Nita. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's like, yeah, I know, because on my end, uh, on the main screen, I mean, those shits are still coming. So, let's see. Um, yeah, although the ironic thing about it is that I think that the layout, if you're comparing the two shows, I think San Diego Comic-Con is a better show than New York Comic-Con, because I think that they're, in terms of the floor they're uh better organized like the 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 separations between the segments you know like like small press and the main you know and uh the large companies um artist alley i kind of liked the way they did that i liked their usage of zones but it was still on the same floor but it was really nice to, you know, it's like you had like these zones that you were in, you know. So, yeah, I just like the organization better at, at San Diego Comic-Con. But it's just, with that, the expense is going there. You know, the expense is, you know, the hotels. Um you know, you're paying $400 a night for a shitty hotel that on normal days wouldn't get $80. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a. Uh, you know, so yeah, so that, that's like, you know, and then it's like everybody jacks up the prices you know, it's a very popular area around the uh, the convention center in San Diego. So even though San Diego is easier for us to get into, it's less expensive, the table, but whatever money you make is going into everything else. It's going into hotel. It's going into the airfare. It's going into, uh, uh, you know, it's like the, the jacked up you know like restaurant prices and then you're talking about shipping your stuff and then all the hotels are charging to store your stuff and you know it's yeah it and then new york comic-con which is just right literally you know right here very difficult to get into like i'm on the waiting list i.e you know you, you we want really want you to pay fifteen hundred dollars for a booth not four hundred dollars for a table um you know and it, yeah and it's like it, yeah um you know and and like i said the show is not very well laid out but like i said i'm basing this on a year where they were doing construction so maybe it's not really fair uh for me to make that um comparison uh so the the thing that you know on, on a side note you know about the artwork so uh, the thing that i've been practicing for a while is uh doing architecture freehand and this is something that when i started drawing the new pages for eagle raven that I really, really wanted to try to get the hang of because when I was doing tall tales, like all the backgrounds would be really ruled out and, and, and whatnot. Like everything is very straight line, you know? And um, when I started to do Eagle Raven, it's like, I felt, you know what? I should really try something different because I was never really happy with how my backgrounds was coming were, was coming out on Tall Tales. Like, it always felt like a little too ruled. You know, you know what I mean? But it's like, it looked like, oh, it's like, like everything is a little too straight. So, um, 
so with this, you know, so with Ego Raven, what I started doing is I started trying to pencil out and then ink out all the backgrounds freehand because what I wanted was kind of like a more organic look. Um, you know, it's like I wanted my backgrounds to feel more like backgrounds and not like cut out sets, which is how I felt they kind of look like in a lot of places in Tall Tales. And, you know, and it was, uh, you know, weird experimenting with that because, um, like I said, everything, you know, my goal was to do everything freehand to be able to not have to pull out a ruler for everything. And, and especially with these last couple of pieces that I, that I've been doing, um, I always make sure to, to force myself to practice that I have an architectural element somewhere in the piece. Like, you know, whether like here it's the manor on the, the, the cover. Uh, when I did the, the volume one cover, I made sure that the castle was there. Same thing with the issue, volume two cover that I just sent to the flatters. There's a, the, you know, there's a castle in the background. There's a tower that, uh, that, that figures prominently, you know, in, in the, the series, um, that's on the cover. So it's like in here, yeah. So here, this is the manner that's the center of everything. So it's like, I felt it was appropriate, uh, not only to put it on the cover, you know, as, you know, because, you know, as a background element, but also to force myself to kind of still practice that, um, doing everything freehand um so i'm actually feeling like i'm getting to a point where i i feel like that it's like aha it, it's kind of feels like it's beginning to come together um where it's not looking completely crazy um i know that especially with some early stuff my freehand backgrounds were looking a little you know kind of janky but i really wanted to push through with that idea so so that's you know so i think that i i, I really do feel like i'm at a point where it's it's kind of beginning to come together um architecture is not my strong suit so, you know, so it, it's something that I felt like I had to force myself to do. Um, and of course, the best way to do that is, is to make sure you incorporate it <laughs> into everything, you know, if you want to force yourself. Um, Oh, well, but that's, that's a given, you know, I mean, that was in San Diego, that was it, you know, especially that's here, you know, um, you're going to pretty much, like, whenever there's a convention, you're, you're going to get that, you know, wherever there's a large group of people, that's, that, you know, what? honestly, I think that's more of a side effect of just being outside, you know, I, look, I live in a major city, so look it's like the second i'm on the train that's that's a given you know so it's yeah it, it's something yeah i wouldn't necessarily call that a con specifically to going to a convention um that's just uh yeah i think that that's just what it is Oh, right. But the, uh, the, the thing that I was saying is that, so if there's something that you really, really hate doing in your drawing, um, yeah, the best way to get better at it is to force yourself to draw that thing you hate over and over and over again. And, um, You know, and, and I really, yeah, and like I said, I really do think it's beginning to come together, um, especially 
when I'm drawing a page and I'm not afraid of drawing backgrounds anymore. Um, I think that that's a very important tell that the practice is, uh, is paying off. Um, this is especially true with drawing humans as well. Um, that's uh, also something that I'm noticing after doing, after really working on Eagle Raven for the past two and a half years, that I'm no longer afraid of drawing humans. You know, um, and, and I'm actually pretty happy with that. And now I'm getting to a point where I'm not afraid of drawing backgrounds. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that, that for me, it was the same thing too. It was my kryptonite, but, but you know what? It's like, you got to do it. You got, if you really want to push forward with your art, you have to learn how to do these things. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, it's like, that's the thing. It's like the AI isn't that good, you know, where, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe I could fake some stuff with AI, but it's like, you know what? I would rather learn how to draw it myself so that if I don't have, which I don't, I don't have access to that or, or whatever, that I can still do it. So, um, which honestly, I think, you know, kind of like going back to the discussion about AI and whatnot. I saw this this cartoon the other day where it was one of uh, Sarah Scribbles, where it's like, you know, where this old lady is asking her, how do you become so talented? And she just kept saying, practice, practice, practice. And every time she said practice, the old lady would dismiss it as some kind of like divine thing. It's like, oh, it's a mystery why you're so t talented. You will never know, you know, the gods have blessed you, you know, stupid shit like that. Right? It's like, no, it's practice. Um, and then someone had altered the final panel to be the old lady saying, look at this artwork that I've done in AI uh, by saying that expertise is necessary for art that's gatekeeping and then her art the little art character the little artist character saying it's like you know I didn't see that coming for like 10,000 miles away and you know and it's like yeah, it's like people kind of got pissy at it. And I mean, so did I. It's like, you know, it's like I go, you know, it's like there are people out there who really do deserve to have all the shit that they've consumed done by AI so that they can leave actual creative people alone. And and then it's like I really started to think about it. It's like, you know, like, oh, these people. And the only reason he posted this cartoon was because he had seen somebody say that because it's like they were really messing with the keywords in the AI and really had to fuss with the artwork that was coming out, that they felt like an artist. And it's like, oh, no, you know, it's like, you know, but the thing is, though, it's like, OK, you know what? Let them say their stupid shit. You know, it's like, let them say their stupid shit, because you know why? Because when the lights, when the power goes out, when all of a sudden they have no connection to internet all of a sudden they're not an artist anymore you know because that's the thing you know it's like if they don't have their computer if they don't have their keywords if they don't have access to that app all of a sudden they can't do shit. <coughs> the, the lights can go out right now the power can like go out right now and i will still be able to do this you know give me a paper give me a pencil give me a knife i will you know sharpen the pencil you know um yeah no we were just talking about yeah marvin we were just talking about him at the beginning of the show um yeah it's just it's just really crazy that it was just, it was just like that's like like that it was just like 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 that um like I said, he was at the airport. He had the heart attack at the airport that took him to the hospital. And that was it, you know, um, on the way to New York Comic Con. Um, you know, oh, but the thing is, oh, yeah. So the uh, the 
the AI, yeah, so that AI stuff. So it's like, okay, all right, you can feel as much of an artist as you want with the AI. But the second that power goes off, the second that AI, you know, the, the internet goes off, you're still the nobody that can't do shit, you know? Um, because like I said, you give me a pencil, a knife, piece of paper, look, I'll, I'll be there like a caveman, but I'll still be able to draw. I'll still be able to get my work done, you know? Um, you know, it's, you know, so it, you know, that, you know, so that's why in the end, I'm not, I'm not uh, concerned uh, about the AI stuff. Um, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, it's like, cause, cause you know what? It's like, these are, these are people, these are pretenders. They're always going to be pretenders. And, uh, and I don't think that they're anything that it's, it's anything to really worry about in terms of, um, artists. I mean, granted, if you're a commercial artist, yeah, you're, you're going to have a hard time competing with that, but that's a different aspect of it it still doesn't stop you from being an artist that's the thing yeah i know right <laughs> yeah no i mean it's like we are just flooded today i mean what's ironic is that um i had played of an ai reading a page from my novel from the first draft and like after you know, and then it's like after, um, oh, okay. Yeah. And then after I, uh, oh, okay. All right. You know what? Okay. There we go. We're not going to do that. We're going to, uh, yes. Okay. So we're going to, yes. Uh, we've been having issues, but it's okay. It's okay. We're still, we're still working. We're still, uh, we're still moving forward. So, um, so yeah, so where where was I? Where was I? Um Ah uh, yes, yes, doing doing backgrounds freehand. So, you know, so that's that's how I knew that uh, I was uh finally reaching a point in my artwork where the practice where the constant grinding uh was really beginning to pay off. Um you know, like I said, it's like the you get some really, really janky results first. You know, you get some really janky results. But um, there comes a point where things start being less janky. <laughs> you know? Uh, and I think that I'm, you know, it's like I, I kind of reached that with people, you know, with drawing humans. And I'm getting to that point with my backgrounds as well. So, you know, so yes, like I said, it's like, uh, you know, so yes. And, and, and that's the thing. It's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not concerned about these people who all of a sudden want to say something stupid, like, um, like, oh, uh, requiring expertise is gatekeeping. Um, here's the thing. Yes, it is. Yes, requiring expertise is gatekeeping. You know, it's like, if I want something, it's like, if I want to hire somebody to do a variant cover, I'm not hiring some bullshit hack who can barely draw a straight line with a ruler. I want somebody with expertise. That's what I'm paying for, you know? Um, you know, um, you know, it, it's, yeah, I, I just find it really, that's like saying that it's, I don't know, would they, would they say that about a doctor? Yeah, I guess they would. I mean, we just spent the last two and a half years of people screaming that doctors have no expertise, that doctors don't know, that because you know, it's like, well, I read this thing. Some guy making a video in his car said that this shit is fake. So what does a doctor know? It's like, yeah, okay, you know what? You can't argue with those people. You know? <laughs> you know? Um, you know, it's like, 
you know, I mean, you know, so, um, but the thing is, though, I think it's something a little bit deeper than that. I think that when it comes to a lot of the AI dis discussion, what it really, uh, but the thing is, though, it's not necessarily just regulated to AI. Um, it's like, we, we see this a lot in publishing. Like, I've been seeing this for decades, really. This is an attitude that I've been seeing for decades. Um, that... Um, that they're people who have no, not one creative bone in their body, but they want, they're so desperate to be creative, to be known as a creative. So the only thing they could do is kind of latch onto it, you know, and say, well, I produce comics, I make comics. So oh, it's like, oh, I write comics, you know? Um, and... You know, and it's like, as and, and in the end, it all boils down to, you know, but at the same time, they're also desperate to make money, too. So what it is, they make the most derivative crap that they can put together, the, the best derivative crap money can buy, right? And then all of a sudden, now they consider themselves comic book creators, right? Or, or, or creative. They sell an AI painting at a state fair, you know, um, you know, um, and all of a sudden it's like, they are so proud to now be a part, to say that they're a part of their, that community when technically they're not. Because like I said, it's like, you know, okay, so what can you do without your computer? Oh, nothing. Okay. Right. All right. Then, then no, you, you don't know what it's like. Um, You know, so yeah, so in the end, it's like these people are going to get, I think, like weeded out just as quickly. So let's see here. Um, yeah, I want good storytelling that does not involve identity po politics. Well, that's that's a, that's a separate issue. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, well, you see, that's that's kind of the the funny thing. Um, I think that that's what's happening there is that people are confusing media consumption with activism and, and this has been happening for like especially in the last couple of years um where it's like people feel like that they're so impotent you know so powerless everywhere else the only thing that they feel feels like activism that they're doing something is by criticizing media you know and the thing is is that companies have latched on to that these billion dollar corporations have latched on to it because what they've realized is that if they can feed into that false sense of activism then they have a stand for life you know they have this person who they they've completely wrapped their identity around this product around you know and and now it's like well if i don't consume this product i'm not a good person right conversely they're going around saying that if you consume other types of products that you're a bad person so you kind of have like this weird I mean, this really, really weird terminally online thinking process that a lot of these publishing companies are confusing, which is, it's kind of like goes both ways. They're confusing this really, really terminally online chicken cutlet thinking um, as an actual demographic to cater to. That's, that's the funny thing about it. So you're talking about these people are depending on corporations to fulfill their sense of identity, of political identity, while at the same time, these corporations think that these are, this is a valid demographic to cater to. So that's kind of how you're in, you're, you're seeing this mess in uh, publishing right now. 
you know, in, in both like book publishing and in uh, and uh, in, uh, in in comics. And it, it and I think it goes hand in hand too with the this adverse reaction against conflict in a story. Like actual conflict. Like, you know, the basis of storytelling in general. And there is actually a move movement, because like I said, it's terminally online people claiming this is bigger than it really is. And the, the I guess the media executives at these companies are kind of taking it at face value and uh where it's like that to actually like put your characters through conflict is is practically a war crime that you can't do that's like oh how dare you treat your characters that way you know or blah 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 it's you know the word that i fucking love so much um so what happens is that it's very you know so it's like so if you want to like get in in these particular mainstream roads people are writing like these really milk toast like nothing stories you know where it's like yeah the big deal is that this character is gay there's nothing else going on but this character is a woman this character is a person of color you know, it's like, but there's nothing, the story says nothing else. The character does nothing else. That's the identity. That's it. You know, and somehow corporations are, are making people believe that this is all they need. You know, that this is all a story needs to be. It's kind of like um, the, the difference between you know like people who watch lord of the rings people who say they enjoy lord of the rings and people who say they enjoy game of thrones you know the house of the dragon um and it's just really funny to see the difference between the two where now mind you this is all conjecture and this is all opinion you know if you enjoy lord of the rings that's fine you know i'm not saying otherwise um but the thing is though is that the lord of the rings show is so mealy and so like they it's like high stakes and lo like it's so low stakes at the same time like they're trying to make it like this grand story but it's so low stakes everybody is you know you know everybody's able to solve it it's like you know, everybody is grand, you know, everybody, you know, is like, you know, Galadriel is, of course, you know, oh, she's the strong female character, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's just kind of like, and the, the thing that I keep hearing that it is that's boring as fuck, because there's no real story to it, there's no real conflict in it. As opposed to Game of Thrones, as opposed to House of the Dragon, holy shit. Um, I got sucked into an episode the other night. And I was like, who are all these hot characters? And 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 they they are all fucking each other one way or another, literally and figuratively. And I might need to see this from the beginning. You know, it's a grimy show um you know but it has so much character so much conflict so much stakes in it that it's like you know yeah are the characters not likable no they're not they're not supposed to it really reminded me of watching i claudius um where it's like you know it's it's you know, you're, you're following these, you know, you're following Augustus, you know, his family from Augustus to, to Nero, you know, I, I mean, it, you know, and it's like, and it's grimy because everybody is doing what they need to do to survive. You know, it, it's like to survive 
in a situation where everybody wants you dead. You know? Um, I mean, you're not going to come out a nice person from that. You know, it's like, and even if you are nice, you're not going to survive it. You know, I mean, you know, and, and that's, you know, and that's kind of like the vibe I got from House of Dragons. But, of course, you have these chicken cutlets online saying that if you like House of Dragons, it means you're an awful person because you're enjoying watching a show about awful people. And I go, yes, because they're fucking fictional. You know, it's like... You know, yes, I am not concerned about watching American Psycho. You know, I mean, it's like, granted, the book, it, it's like, I love American Psycho as the book. I'm not crazy about the movie, although, Patch, uh, although uh, Christian Bale, perfect. Movie, not so much so. But it's really the book that I refer to. Whenever I mention American Psycho, I'm, I'm mentioning, I'm, I'm referring the book with <laughs> Christian Bale is, as, as the character, you know? Um yeah, the whole idea is that, yes, I'm, I'm living vicariously through these characters. They're fictional. It's kind of like a mental roller coaster, you know? Um, you know, and, you know, people go on roller coasters. People who go on roller coasters doesn't mean they like being in car crashes and actual car crashes, okay? But that's what these assholes want to make it sound like. You know, that if you enjoy watching a show about a family of sociopaths trying to kill each other, that that means you're a sociopath. It's like, no, it means I'm fucking watching a show. It means that I am enjoying a show. You know? Um, and, you know, so the thing is, though, so when you talk about, you know, so yeah, so when you're talking about, um, you know, I, I just want a story. I don't want identity politics. Right. It's like it's like I understand what you're saying, because it's like what because what we're seeing is a very cynical cash grab by corporations using personal identity as a superficial hook for consumers. That's all that is. They don't give a shit about you. Why do you think they only celebrate, you know, like uh, all, you know, all, all the rainbows disappear when June is over, right? It's like, they don't give a shit. If they gave a shit, it's like, you'd be finding these products year round, right? But no, it's like, the, it's like from June 1st to June 30th or 34th. I don't know. Does June have 30? I think June has 30 days. Um, that's it. That's it. I was like, th this is, this is the only time we, we support gay people when you know we can we can squeeze the most money out of them you know um you know yeah it's like that's i, I mean it, you see what it is is that it, it depends you know it's like look nasty characters are entertaining you know i mean that that's really all it boils down to do i actually want to be you know uh Patrick Bateman do I actually want to be Tyler Durden you know it's like do I actually want a doctor that's fucking like house MD absolutely not like Gregory House absolutely not I never want to meet Gregory House in person you know I mean but they're fun the attitude is fun that that's what I mean by like living vicariously you know because normal people cannot act like this and that type, and it can only be entertaining in fiction. You know, that's the thing. You know, you do not want to meet Patrick Bateman in person. You know, um, you know, but he's fun in the book. But like fun, you know, being relative, of course. Um, you know, so it's like. You know, but the thing is, though, it's like, so we have these people who think that, oh, well, if you enjoy Patrick Bateman, it must mean that you're a bad person. It's like, no, it means I enjoy a character. I enjoy the characterization. I enjoy his antics. You know, it's like, I, I enjoy, you know, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like, it, it's, it, they're fictional. 
they're fictional, you know. And the problem is, though, you see, and this is the thing. I'm not saying that a misunderstanding of these characters makes it okay, too. You know, where it's like you do have the people who think that Tyler Durden is something, you know, that should be emulated. Is a character that should be emulated. You know, it's like, you know, it's like there's certain fictional characters, you know. I mean, you know, it's like, look, it's like, you know, what it is is that because because you're also these people what it is that they're flattening the conversation out so much that it forces me to be an absolutist because i can't get through their thinking you know and their thinking is kind of you know it's like look you know yes media can be used to be harmful you know media can be used as propaganda for certain things you know, think, I mean, even something as benign as, say, the idea of, like, wedding rings, right? I mean, it, it's like it wasn't until the 40s, right, when De Beers really needed to create this fake market for a product that was essentially worthless. You know, and they did it through movies, they did it through Hollywood, they created this whole, you know, engagement ring propaganda thing. And then now it's like you have people thinking that engagement ring, no, it's always been a tradition, you know, and it's like, no, it's only been around since the 40s. I mean, it, it's in the 40s and 50s. It's like, um, you know, you know, it's like, I, it's like, that's the thing. It's like, we're not there. It's like, the conversation that everything in media is black and white doesn't allow for nuance. And, and I think that that's kind of, uh, um, I don't know, maybe that's deliberate, that they really don't want people discussing this, that they don't want people challenging this because they've wrapped their personality so much into that. So, um, Right. Yeah. I, I mean, you see, that's the thing. And it's like, you know, where they think that, oh, if a writer writes bad things, it means that the writer endorses them. Like there was this joke before uh, there was this meme going around where someone put like, like Martin Scorsese, like they make it sound like you say, yes, it's like, uh, I, I love I, I love mob people. I endorse all their murders. You know, I mean, it's so stupid, you know, I mean, but I, I yeah, but like I said, this is corporations feeding into that because it's like, you know, I, I think that they thought that maybe that they could control a certain aspect of fan culture and it kind of morphed into like this weird thing that we all now have to suffer through, you know? And, and like I said, I think that it, it flattens out the conversation that it's like, yeah, it's like, look, I'm not saying that media can't be used as propaganda, but that's not what they're talking about. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, you know, they want to keep screaming about how all the Evangelion characters are 14, so stop drawing horny characters, you know, horny pictures about uh, of them. And it's like, they're fictional characters. They don't exist. You know, and, and this is also the thing, too, where it's like they start treating people like fi real people, like fictional characters. There was this whole discourse where they were talking about, like, like I said, these chicken, terminally online chicken cutlets were talking about, were pointing at real people and saying that if you're like, if you're a grown man, it's like dating a short woman it means you're a pedophile because a short woman is is coded as a child and it's like what the fuck are you talking about it's like i'm short that's all it fucking is you know it's like i'm not coded anything i'm a real person i'm not a fucking fanfic character you know, coded is shit that's written 
you know, it, it's like that that that's done for a fictional character, and you know, and it's like it, it's like, but they're actually trying to translate that to real people, and it's like it's like you. You know what? It's like, I don't know how you you guys are going to grow up and survive this shit. Like I I don't know. It's like I really do hope they they get to a point where they're turning 25 and then it's like they or or 30 and then it's like they they kind of like do like looking back on live journal shit and then they're going, "Oh my god, I can't believe I wrote this." This is so stupid. You know, it's like, like, I really do hope that that eventually happens. Um, because it is, it is just so, God, um, it, it just, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I mean, yeah. You know, like we were talking, like um, there was a post the other day about 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 villains, right? About the fact that you know, like oh, it seems like everybody needs a redemption arc. You know that there's this need for all the villains to have a redemption. And it's like, and I told them, it's like, look again, this is a cynical move by corporations who create this whole narrative of redemption arcs, i.e. everyone's in therapy, um, because they need, they, they figure that these characters, certain characters have become too popular, have become popular, so they need to soften them in order to make them more marketable. You know, it's kind of like to use Kylo Ren as an example. I love Kylo Ren in the first movie. Loved him in the second movie. Like I could tell that that was like the only character the writers actually liked. You know, because it's like, I mean, I was like going, that was a character that they were committed to making evil. And I really hoped that, you know, that they, that would carry on uh, with um, with the rest of the series. I, I didn't see the last movie. Um, and... You know, but I heard that's like, oh, it's like, you know, oh, they turned, they they redeemed the character and this, that, and the other thing. And I go, what? There was no purpose to redeem that character. He killed his father. He murdered his father. What what was what what is what is there to redeem? He's an asshole. He's a genocidal maniac. You know, redeem him for what? So he could kiss the main character, so all the fanfic chicks, all the all the Raylos would uh would rejoice, you know? It's like, no, part of his appeal was that he was an asshole. Why? Because he's a fictional character and he didn't need to be anything else but, you know? But, you know, the court, but Disney was like, going, oh, no, 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 no. We can't have a popular character be this evil, you know, which is why, you know. And, and and that's what it is. Like me personally, I don't. It's like, look, not every character deserves, not every villain deserves a redemption arc. Some characters are just assholes, and that's it. You know, and that's what makes that's what makes them appealing. You know, it's like, like I said, I'm watching House of the Dragons. It's like, do I give a shit if anyone redeems? No, I don't. Everybody is just doing what they need to do to survive the situation that they're in. There is no redemption. For a lot of these characters it's just this is how they're living you know and the thing is though and and you see and the thing is though that there's usually this mistake where people like they think that oh as long as the character says he's sorry that that's redemption and it's like no redemption is you actually change your behavior but here's the thing it's like we're talking about they want redemption, but they still want the shitty behavior. That that's not redemption. It's like what it is is that you want to feel good about yourself liking a particular character being an asshole. And it's like, no, own up to your shit. If you like a character for being an asshole, own up to it. Don't put in this, like, again, this whole morality thing where it's like, well, if I like this character, that means I'm a bad person. It's like, no. It's it, you're enjoying media. It's a neutral thing. 
you know i mean superficially it's supposed to be neutral like i said it's like that it's very you can get into it's like you know like okay yes it's like you know media does get used you know to put forth like ideas that maybe it shouldn't and blah blah, blah. like you know like there was this other cartoon that i saw where it's like you know in the 80s how like every comedy was about how much the husband hated his wife you know the whole married with children thing and it's like and everyone's looking back on it and it's like you know what really was funny about this show you know aside from the fact that why wouldn't al bundy why why was al bundy always did never wanted to bang peggy you know everyone's saying it's like you know you, you know it's like this is you know he's married to the hot chick and it's like and he's angry about it what the fuck is that? it's like look that was a thing during the 80s you know the whole rodney dangerfield take my wife please you know it was was it him that said there was i think there was like you know all the comedians at the time were doing that oh you know i hate my wife so much oh that's all they have to say you know i mean it's like look uh you know that's if there was ever it, it's like like that's a real conversation to have like what the fuck was with that you know but um it, you know it's kind of like all these sitcom writers it's like look bros it's like i'm really sorry that you're in shitty marriages and you really it's like uh, what you need to do is get a divorce and you know not take it out on your viewing audience but you know that's what uh, <laughs> that's what happened um Oh man, it's like, did I ever really go into the topic of the show? I was getting so distracted by a lot of things, you know, or it's like, you know, like a lot of different trains of thoughts, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, it's like, like I said, it, it's the quiet lull between campaigns, just waiting for stuff to come in and you know, I'm kind of like, oh, I really should be, you know, I'm trying to distract myself with with all the work that I have to do. But at the same time, I can't help but be like a numbers whore about how my next can how I'm gonna get my next campaign to perform. You know, and it's just like, ugh. Yeah. You know. I mean, yeah, I think that, you know, when you start doing as many, when, when you do as many campaigns as I do, and it starts, um, uh, <laughs> let's see, um, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. So, so at least technically I'm always on topic no matter what, right? um let's see i, I mean yeah it, exactly you, you know it's like yeah it just gets yeah it's like the, the more you like little things just get weirder and weirder like like i think in like the 50s like the shit was like like women getting spanked all the time like it's like again it's like what the fuck was with that you know i mean you know like you know um i mean it's like uh, what what do you mean it looks gigantic like the nib is really thick i mean i mean it's okay you know this is um what is it this is a point three you know i mean you know i mean that's i, I don't know i mean i have one that's larger that i'm going to you know go in um you know uh, a larger uh, pen that I'm going to go in with. Um, you know, also, um, what it is, too, is that this piece is also kind of smaller, too. Like, okay, so, like, this is usually what I'm... This, this is 11 by 17. I mean, it's kind of hard. You know, it, it takes up uh, the entire screen, of course. You know, so this is 11 by 17, and this, I think, is uh, 14, 11 by 14 or something. So it's, you know, so you have, like, this much, you know, you have that much space. 
you know, right there. Uh, oh, uh, probably this one, this one. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's just a pit pen. It's just a pit pen. It's like, yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't use like crow quills or anything like that where it's like usually they have like the really long handles. I, I don't I don't use that. I, I just use pens. It's just better control for me. Um because yeah, because also the thing is too that I learned um this past week or so, especially with some of the proofs that I had to correct, is that doing a novel and doing a comic book, um, I have to design the covers differently. So with a novel, like this one with a novel, I have to be more kind of like square while with a trade paperback for a comic, I can, I, I can be more rectangle. So, um, luckily with this one, uh, you know, I already set it up, you know, according to the specs that I kind of mocked up for a novel. So, uh, you know, the, the cover is technically correct. Uh, but there was a proof that I had to fix where I had to extend it because I was trying to move a comic book cover to a different medium and I didn't have enough lead essentially. So I had to extend it. So now when I do my future covers, I have to go in, like I finished the, the cover for issue for volume two, which comes at the end of next year. So I did it regular that I usually do on 11 by 17. And then I took it into Photoshop and then I extended it to uh, 14 by 17. And then I extended the top and the bottom so that I can, so I got that colored so that the piece, no matter which medium I moved it to, um, the image will still fit correctly. So, um, you know, so, so yeah, so that's, uh, so that's, uh, that was something that I learned this week that it's like, uh, just to, that, especially if you're going to start to change formats, not medium formats, formats. Um, yeah, it, it's like, you, you have to really take that in consideration with your artwork that what works in one format might not work in another. Um, so with this, with this piece, um, I don't have to worry about it because it's not for anything that'll be printed comic book size. It's going to be printed, um, in a six by nine. So I guess to give you kind of like a comparison. So this is comic size and this is the format, the six by nine format that I'm going to be using with the novel, with the illustrated novel. Um, and just to give you an idea, like this is, this is kind of the format that I'm looking to do, uh, aside from comics, just doing, um, illustrated novels. So, uh, luckily the piece that I used for this cover was able to translate to the, the different format. So I didn't have to do anything for it, but, um, I had to, to correct some proofs this week uh because of that uh you know so so yeah you know well you know i, I mean i in the end it's like i didn't get so so we're almost at the top of the second hour um i really didn't get uh, as much done as I would have liked. I, I kind of thought I would have inked in more, but, um, ah, you know how it is on, on these shows, you know, it's like, you, you know how it is. It's like, this is more like a very casual, like kind of like you're seeing me at a convention type of thing. So, um, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I really shouldn't be expecting, uh, you know, to, to like actually finish. Like, um, I, I'm not going to run a four hour stream. You know, I, it's like, I, I see people do that, especially on Twitch. And I'm like, going, oh my God, it's like, this literally is a job for you. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, but they're, you know, they're working, they're working on screen. They just happen to be recording it and broadcasting it to everybody. So, um, you know, it's not, 
you know, but I, no, it's like, I, I need to, uh, I, I, I can't really do that. So, okay, so this is, this is pretty much as far as I'm going to get for today. I mean, I'm going to, I mean, after I get off the, the stream, I mean, granted, I'm going to probably continue more, at least try to finish this side of the cover. Um, so, so here you go. So here, as you can see, um, so this is, this is the difference. So this is, this is what I start off with. I use, like I said, it's like I lay the basic ink down with my number two rapidograph and then I build up the inks with the thicker, um, uh, it, yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Yes. I inked in, uh, Let's see. Um, yeah, with with the novels, um, it, with the illustrated novels, I know that I'm going to have to kind, of, I'm going to have to like think differently for them as opposed to a comic, uh, because I don't sign my comics. You know, I, it's like I don't know if anyone's ever noticed, but I don't sign my comics. Um, but um, I know that with novels, especially illustrated novels, it's a little bit different like so yeah probably it's going to be like there's going to be signed options there's going to be like art plate like oh like this is something that i'm playing around with too um so this is going to th this is my my kind of like my prototype for like a sketch plate i know that that signed book plates are are kind of a thing so i was thinking of playing around with the idea with sketchbook plates um and you know and then like tipping them into the book or something so i like i said it's like with illustrated novels i I'm, you know i have i know i have to think differently for it um why don't i sign my comics um because i personally don't like it um it's a personal thing um i yeah it's like i i, I don't know it's like i kind of like i it doesn't really mean anything to me and i hadn't I've, I've yet to have anybody really make an issue of it well they haven't like i said i don't think anyone's really noticed that i don't sign my stuff although the the promo uh the promo postcard um i i think i usually sign these i'm not i, I don't remember I, don't, I think i usually do um so that which reminds me that i have to sign the postcard but the promo postcard and that, you know, that's usually how you get my signature, but not on the actual book. Um, yeah, that's what I usually get to. It's like, you know, like, like, uh, like, you know what it is? It's like, unless they're get they're, they're, they're deliberately, specifically getting it slabbed. I, I don't think that most people really care. Um, oh, uh, do I, do I sign the postcards? Yeah. Okay. There we go. So I, I signed the postcards. So, uh, yes, and of course the sketch covers are signed, of course. Um, so, yeah, it's it's just a personal thing. I mean, if, if it was, yeah, it, that that's, yeah. But, like, for novels, I know it's different. Um, I know it's, it's kind of like a different thing going on, so I would have to kind of, I would have to, you know, rethink a lot of things. Uh... <laughs> Oh no! Right, yes, of course. You know, I, I mean, you know, um, I mean, honestly, uh, if if signed comics is something that you are interested in having me do, when you make your Kickstarter pledge, put it in the notes. Uh, that, that I know that there's a section for notes as to like, so it's like, so if that's something, because I've had people do that. Uh, where it's like they add, and not only that, but they that they they tell me specifically where to sign. Like, oh, sign on the inside cover, sign on the first page, you know, sign, you know, I, like I, like they want it signed, but not on the cover, you know, type of thing. So, um, so if you so for the, any Kickstarter, if you want anything signed by me, just put it in the notes, and I will sign it. Um, but as like kind of like a default thing, I don't I don't do that. So. Um, so like I said, so here's the, the piece so far for the cover. And and the thing is, though, too, here's a little trick, you know, that uh, 
that I decided to do on this cover too. So you see this tree right here in the center. So the prototype, kind of like the little prototype book that I did just to make, um, just to kind of get the measurements. Um, oh no, that would be, uh, that would be Stanley. That would be Stanley. Um, I know that his manager was actually, I mean, it was, I, I mean, really, it, it's like that guy deserved to, um, no, <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> So, um, so the, the, I, I put it together using my first draft just so that I can get the measurements, um, just so I can get the measurements down, uh, so that I can get this cover. But the thing is though, I know that depending on how the editing process works and how the, uh, and how maybe the final formatting works, that um i might have to make adjustments especially to the spine so what i did was i purposefully designed this cover so that the tree is the spine so that if i needed to expand the spine somehow all i have to do is add to this tree and then i can like i can adjust the cover without affecting the main um and without affecting any of the main images for uh the cover so uh, i don't know i thought i was being clever with that so i don't know i just thought i'd just share you know it's it, it, you know something stupid to end uh the the show on uh for today a very exciting show i might add um so okay so there we go here's the piece so far i'm going to be slowly working on it you know as uh as i go along today um, you know, just to, just to get it finished so I can get it scanned up and sent, uh, to the flatters, uh, tonight. So, or tomorrow morning, you know, that's, uh, um, so yeah, so let me just shut this. Okay. Okay. And, um, all right. So here we go. So, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. Um, and here we are. So here we are at the a little, a little past, uh, the second hour. And, uh, yeah, we had a very exciting day today. Uh, but, uh, you know, we had a lot of good conversation. We had a lot going on, a lot to talk about. And uh, I'm very happy that everybody was, uh, here to do it. So yeah, so let's, uh, yeah, let me fix that. Let me fix that. Okay. So yeah, so, so there we have it. So here we are at the end of another, um, you know, at the end of another stream. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am, <laughs> I, I see that uh, Jose's blood, JD's blood is worth less than mine. I see. So, <laughs> no, we are not doing that. Um, so here we are at the end of another stream. I hope uh, you guys enjoyed uh, the show. Like I said, it uh, got exciting, got exciting for a bit, but uh, you know, it was all good. Um, you know, it was all, you know, in the end, it was all good. We got some work done and whatnot, had our, you know. So I would like to thank everybody in the comments, except for certain people. <laughs> you suck. You know, you know who you are, you know. But everybody else was beautiful. So thank you for uh, being on the stream, for being in the chat, keeping me engaged. Um, thank you so much for spending these, you know, spending what you could, even if you couldn't stay the whole two hours. I would like to thank currently the seven people um, who are watching right now from regions beyond. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I hope you at least enjoyed listening if you if you weren't watching or at least maybe you were working along and whatnot. You know, like I said, this is pretty much how it goes. It's like whatever, whatever topics people throw at me in the uh, in the chat that's what i talk about you know um you know so if there's something that you you know that you would want me to talk about just you know, come on over to youtube you know join join my you know join, join my sexy chat right here except for the people who suck and uh <laughs> 
And uh, yes, I would like to thank Nita and her magic broom and click finger for taking care of things. You know, it, it's like, you know, it's like uh, she has definitely earned her wrench today. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so here we are. Here we go. So, um, yeah. So uh, if you want to see more about uh, my uh, my work and you want to learn more about me, my work, my upcoming crowdfunders, the whole thing, uh, you can head on over to my main portfolio site at egoworks.com, E-G-O-W-R-K-S. Where you can find links to all of my galleries and social media sites, but I mostly post to Facebook if you're into seeing sketches and current work in progress updates. Um, and don't forget to check me out on YouTube on my channel at Daphne Lage, L A G E Art, and uh, the uh, which also simulcasts through the Indie Comics Network. Uh, so make sure that you like, subscribe, share, you know, the whole nine yards, whatever makes the algorithm of uh, God's happy uh, like i said hit the notification bell so that you get notified whenever um i go live or any of our shows on the indie comics network uh goes live and uh, yeah and uh, for the rest of the year for those of you you know so you know uh, for those of you who don't know you can read the first five issues of eagle raven air the first unicorn in its original black and white format um by the uh, right around the first of the of 2023 i'm going to be taking that down and replacing it with the full color version to serialize on the website. So, uh, yeah. So if you're the type that likes to compare, you know, versions and stuff to see what changed and what didn't, you know, between the original black and white version and what's being, you know, you know, what's, what's being canonized on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on Kickstarter, you know, you have until the end of the year to uh, check everything out. And then I'm going to be taking all that down and starting again with the color version. Oh, but if you prefer your fantasy to be more of a furry Lord of the Rings adventure, you can click the link uh, to Tall Tales, T-A-I-L-S, online.com, and read the first 20 issues of Tall Tales for free. And don't forget to sign up on either of those pages uh, where you get, not only you get free comics, but you will get in your inbox directly updates on all my campaigns, all my projects, everything that's coming up, because we have a lot of campaigns coming up, so... Uh, yes, yeah, so if you don't want to miss anything, um, that, yeah, you, you really want to do that. So, and one last, you know, got to mention it one last time. Like I said, it's like, uh, this is all I'm going to be talking about. Um, Eagle Raven, Air of the First Unicorn, issue five, uh, dropping November 7th on Kickstarter. The pre-launch page is up now. All the links are in the show notes below. Also, while you're at it, check out all the live campaigns that uh, I talked about at the beginning of the show. All those links are also in the show notes as well. But definitely make sure you sign up for Eagle Raven issue five. There's going to be that way you get notified when the second the campaign goes live uh, so you don't miss out on some limited edition goodies, uh, on some, you know, it's like, yes, yeah, some limited time items, you know, I'm probably going to have an early bird special. I know that you guys uh, are not going to want to miss. So do that. So there we go. So thank you again for joining me. Um, and yeah, and I will see everybody Monday uh, with Nita on uh, the Rage into the Vlogs show at 11 a.m. Like I said, we're not having a show on Friday because I have shit to do. And uh, yeah, and we're going to resume our uh, regular scheduled programming back on Monday. And I will, you know, and if you're watching this, I will see you next Wednesday as well. So thank you so much again. And uh, yeah, and I will see you next time. Stay tuned. You really want to know my process? Absolutely. Usually starts with a holla and ends with a creamsicle. And then if there's time in between, thumb.